Yes. And the love you take is equal to the love you make. Yes. Hello, everybody. So, thank you very much for being here. Very kind of you. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make is the very last line from the album by the Beatles, Abbey Road. It's a trio to, to Paul McCartney, and I think that it sums up the 60s that I knew very well. Thus, I'm here to talk to you as a witness, as an elder, and as an activist. And I would also like to, to take this opportunity to talk to you a little about the medical history of LSD. And I hope you won't mind that I jump back and forth in time a little. For those of you who would like to read a shorter version of my talk in German, it's in the latest issue of Lucy magazine, and you can look at it over there. I first heard of LSD in 1964. I was 16 years old. A Dutch girlfriend said, it was a clear liquid that you drip onto a sugar cube to get high. We didn't know what high meant, but it sounded glamorous. You must be careful not to take too much, though, she warned, or you might go crazy. We didn't have any LSD, but we wouldn't be curious enough to try it. Another substance we heard about at the time was hashish, of course. A friend of mine told me, a school friend, that he had a friend who had a friend who, you know, smoked some, but, and that it was uh, liked by artists and musicians. It came out from Africa, by Morocco to Marseille. Especially jazz musicians were supposed to like it, but again, it, it was all hearsay. We, we didn't come near any of these substances in those days. In Neuchâtel, where I went to school at the time, life was still very much black and white. I did know about addiction from when I was a child of about 11 or 12 because of the great French singer Edith Piaf. She uh, became a morphinist due to an accident and, you know, it was always in the newspapers. So the adults explained to me what it meant and of course, I felt very sorry for Edith Piaf. It's just around this time that uh, LSD therapy started to pick up speed. And uh, Sandoz had created this medicine they called Elysid. It came in, in a flask and it was administered, I guess, I'm not really sure how it was administered, uh, not on a sugar cube, I don't think. So um, it was given therapeutically, and at first they had this very manipulative idea that they could create psychoses, but then with time they gradually went to a, took a larger view and they said that, that a dose of 100 micrograms administered to the patient leads to a mildly euphoric state and an elated self-consciousness conducive to psychi psychiatric exploration. In 1952, Ronald A. Sanderson, a British psychiatrist and psychologist, traveled to Switzerland to meet Albert Hoffman. And uh, he worked at the time at a place called Powell, Powell Hospital in an overly, over, <coughs> hopelessly overcrowded psychiatric ward where they were treating people with absolutely antiquated methods, and you can read about all of this for yourselves on the <coughs> websites of Arrowhead or Maps or even on Wikipedia. So these are not secrets people do know about it. There's also a recent book that came out by Thomas Hatze called LSD, The Wonder Child, and it's about this, all these studies that were undertaken in the 50s. Sanderson went back to Poet with a uh, hundred files of Delicid and in 1955 he opened the worldwide the first psychiatric facility to treat patients with LSD. 
the pioneering psychiatrist called the method that he developed psycholytic. Psycholytic means mind loosening. This designation was adopted by SEPT, the Swiss Medical Association for Psycholytic Therapy, and it is to this scientific body that we owe the preeminent position Switzerland enjoys when it comes to psychedelics today. The first license to treat patients, as you probably know, was attributed to Dr. Peter Gasser in 2006, but members of SEPT had been treating therapy-resistant cases already from 1986 onward with uh, permission given by exemption by the government to treat essentially hopeless cases, usually for severe depression. Sanderson and his team brought many improvements to POWIC, which became a model hospital, and they continued working with LSD until its prohibition in England, that was in 1968, mainly also treating up to around 700 people, also mainly for severe, severe depression. Sanderson also continued to believe in the merit and the profit, uh, the, the promise of LSD for psychiatry and psychotherapy, though much like Albert Hoffman too, he was uh, not very enthusiastic about it, its recreational use. And the sensationalist publicity that it attracted. He was almost as long lived as his mentor and he died in 1992 at age 96. Humphrey Osmond, another psychiatrist and psychotherapist, uh, relocated to Canada and there to Saskatchewan, out in the prairie, where he also began, began to study, pa work with patients, first with mescaline, then later also with LSD, and it was him who coined the phrase, together with Aldous Huxley, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting or mind revealing, as it's also often called. They also came up with the famous verslet to fathom hell or sore angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. From 1951 onward, Osmond conducted a wide variety of studies, like I said, first with mescaline, later with LSD, mainly collaborating with Abram Hoffer, Damon, uh, Dr. Blewett, and Margaret Kuttner. Osmond gave Aldous Huxley his first dose of mescaline, and he treated alcoholics with high doses of LSD uh, to try, and, and he said that he cured 50% of them. The way he did it is he gave them up to 1,000 micrograms, 600 and 1,000 micrograms. His first idea had to be to induce a state of uh, delirium tremens because he thought if they got the DTs, they'd be so scared they'd never touch a drop of alcohol again. <laughs> now, of course, uh, you know, delirium tremens is, is a very dangerous, it's a dangerous uh, urological state and it can even lead to death in some cases. And LSD certainly doesn't uh, simulate delirium tremens. Nobody's ever died of LSD, fortunately. But he must have done, he and his patients must have done certain things wrong because they were successful after all. With this we come to Hans Karl Leuner, a German psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. He began to treat patients with psychedelics in Marburg in 1955, first in private practice, then he relocated to Göttingen in 1960, where he initiated a psychotherapy department at the local university. He conducted more than 1,300 individual LSD sessions, working with symbols in a process he called guided effective imagery after Carl Gustav Jung, whereby common objects and images are act as gateways to the patient's subconscious, and the uh, lawyer was interested in establishing the close relationship between what his patients experience, the visions they have, and their personal history. S Sanderson also worked with guided imagery, but not as methodically as Leuner did. The man who went from 
experimenting with LSD to creating and applying holotropic breathwork as a gateway to altered state, the Czech-American psychiatrist Stanislav Grof uh, experimented in Prague, but he was also one of the fathers of transpersonal psychology, founded in 1969 by him, Abraham Maslow and Anthony Sutic, to integrate spiritual and transcendental states into psychology. The very important. Dr. Groff studied the psyche on LSD, this he did in Prague, but later in the US he gave terminally ill patients LSD, and he was the first to do so, just like Osmond was the first to treat patients for alcoholism with LSD. In this, uh, Groff collaborated with his wife, uh, she is the American Zen Buddhist teacher, anthropologist, e ecologist, and civil rights af activist Joan Halifax, his first wife, is an extraordinary woman in her own right. And the book that they wrote about it is called Encounter with Death. It was published in 1977. The Jungian analyst Leonard Zeff lived in Oakland, California, and was introduced to LSD in 1961. By the mid-60s, he was known as the underground guru of Berkeley and he established the first psychedelic therapy group in the Bay Area where patients shed entire layers of fear and depression. As Claudio Naranjo put it, who went on to become, he was a, a Chilean-American psychiatrist who came, went on to also become a famous psychedelic therapist, among many other things. The doses used in those days were of 250 micrograms upward. So that was kind of a minimum. There were countless individual uh, psychedelic pioneers working therapeutically, and I'm really only scratching the surface here by naming a few, the few early explorers, actually. So enter Timothy Leary, a brilliant psychologist who defined the term set and setting as well as reality tunnel which holds that your interpretation of and interaction with reality is based on your own experiences and beliefs. In this, he matched Hans Karl Leuner's interests. Timothy Leary and his Harvard group kick-started the psychedelic revolution by letting LSD and psilocybin escape from the ivory tower of academia. Leary used a signature phrase which he had developed together with the Canadian media guru Marshall McLuhan, that he presented to his young audience, and you know it all, turn on, tune in, and drop out. Thrown out of Harvard in 1963, Timothy Leary, Richard Alpert, later known as Ramdas, Ralph Metner, and others, founded the International Federation for Internal Freedom, if, if, and they uh, relocated to Zihuahua, Zihuantanejo in Mexico for a summer of LSD therapy for the rich and famous. The first summer all went well. From literally thousands of applications, they chose mostly friends and their friends. They all lived at the Catalina Hotel, which was made up of a main house where Leary and his th fellow therapists lived, as well as a row of bungalows where the patients lived. You had to sign up to the program for at least four weeks. Participants took turns taking LSD on the supervision of Leary and his colleagues. The second summer, the summer of 1964, many of the people who had been there the first summer were dying to come back, so we had many old guests, but also new guests. But then, unfortunately, by that time, word had gotten around, so they also had gawkers, gate crashers, undercover agents, unwanted media attention, all of it. There were also occasional bumps in the psychedelic road. One doctor, for instance, thought he was a, 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 an ape, and he developed simian powers and had to be subdued. <laughs> yeah, six... Leary, he writes about it in his autobiography, he's kind of ashamed, he said, my God, we had to, six of us had to hold him down, and how undignified, but that's how it was. 
And then there was a government agent who feared for his mental sanity. But later, when Timothy was back in America and he called him up and he asked him how he was, he said, well, it was a blessing. He could go back to being an engineer like he'd been before. And he wasn't subject to all the secrecy and sneaking around anymore. So, okay. Tim and his entourage handled these freakouts well enough. However, six weeks into the second season, Mexi the Mexican authorities bowed to American pressure. They uh, shut down the training center and extradited the flamboyant group for running a business on a tourist visa. Legit legitimate enough. They tried their luck in the Caribbean, but eventually returned to the US and moved into the Hitchcock Estate in Millbrook, a huge mansion in Upper New York State, built in a style that has been called fake Bavarian, had 62 rooms. I don't know how many bathrooms, probably if it were today, 64. So it was put at their disposal by these million and billionaire heirs, the siblings of the Hitchcock family, who were connected to the Mellon fortune. And before we come to the other group of psychedelic evangelists, the merry pranksters, I want to talk a moment about the Situationist International. They were a group of French artists and activists who started to meet around 1957. The motto of the Situationists was ne travaillez jamais, don't ever work. A phrase coined by Guy Debord, their informal leader. He meant that artists, artists should be playful and draw from their creativity rather than labor over what they were doing. And the Swiss-American artists Jean Tangeli and Niki de saint Fal, who had, clo had closed ties also to the city of Basel, worked along these lines. And of course, this can be applied to many walks of life, this idea of don't work, be creative, let it be a pleasure, let it inspire you. And the beats took over. Some had already promoted this kind of worldview with their traveling lifestyle, and the hippies preferred to work as little as possible. Doesn't mean they didn't do anything, but they didn't want to be slaves of labor. The Mary Francis were po post-beat and pre-hippie, whose lifestyle they inspired. The collection of wild cards were led by the best-selling writer Ken Kesey, whose one flew over the cuckoo's nest, remains a celebrated work of American literature. The pranksters were decidedly working class. Some of them were Vietnam veterans. Kesey himself had worked as a, I don't even know the word in English, when you chop, chop trees down? A lumberjack, that's the word I'm looking for, sure. So Kesey threw these LSD fuel parties at his farm in Oregon, described by Tom Wolfe in the electric acid Kool-Aid Kool test. His friends, uh, you know, that threw, they, they met, they threw acid, and they danced and partied to the music of uh, the Warlocks, their house band, soon renamed as the Grateful Dead. These parties, called acid tests, were the precursors of today today's raves where hedonism was discovered as a lifestyle for the masses. And when too many people started to show up at Kesey's farm, he and his friend Ken Bubs took the show on the road. To this end, they bought a 1939 school bus, they repainted it with flowers all over and they called it further. And they took off up and down the West Coast and they turned down thousands of mostly young people with Kool-Aid laced with LSD. So the way you want to imagine this, it's like here they, they uh, found a venue, they printed posters and so on, people came. And on the one side of the room, you had these jugs or cauldrons or something with LSD in, in the Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid is a kind of a lemonade. 
And over here you have, and, and over here with the, with the MSD, you have ladles and paper cups, and you could take as much as you wanted. Over here, you have the same Kool-Aid, but without the LSD. And further down the line, there was some orange juice you could drink if you had gone overboard here a little bit. So that's how it went. And um, you see, they were the pranksters with Dionysian in nature. They lacked scientific rigor or guided spirituality, but culturally they made an equally big difference as the Lyriites, let's say. Many of you are too young to remember the heated political atmosphere of the 60s and 70s. We were against the war in Vietnam, saw ourselves as street fighting women or men. We demonstrated at huge rallies, both in the Americas and in Europe. We were feminists and part of the student movement or part of the underground. All of this in the name of a revolution that didn't happen the way it was planned. That it had been cultural in nature only started to surface about 10 years later. And it wasn't political, so. Meanwhile, at the millionaire's mansion in Millbrook, lots of M's there, Leary, Alpert, and Metzner wrote their influential book, The Psychedelic Experience, based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Leary and his group also discovered hedonism, but they didn't give up the scientific way of working, and they still used therapy as a means of helping people make sense of the things they encountered while on LSD. Having traveled the West Coast long and large in the form of they and, and gathering a lot of dust in, in, terms of, in the sense of media attention, the pranksters decided to visit the New York World Fair. At the wheel of further, Neil Cassidy, living legend and real life model, model for Dean Moriarty in Jack Kerouac's book, On the Road. 1957 <coughs> was published. The poet and activist Allen Ginsberg was also on board when Further pulled into Hillbrook in the late summer of 1964. Ken Kesey, Ken Babs, and Leary met late at night, but they soon, in the main house, they soon realized that they didn't have the same ethos. The pranksters had no use for incense sticks, Indian chins, or meditation. However, they did understand that Leary's and their groups were like two sides of the same coin. Apollo versus Dionysus, the elite versus the people. They parted on friendly terms. Soon, things got out of hand at Millbrook, much like they had gone south in Mexico. The golden days were over. After the place was raided a second time, Tim and his children moved back to California only to get arrested in the border town of Laredo, Laredo Texas. Collusion between U.S. and Mexican border agents and trapped Leary's. Leary's conviction and odyssey that saw him either in jail, or it started an odyssey that saw him either in jail, on the run, or in hiding for the better part of 10 years. LSD became an illegal drug in California in 1966, and upon request by the World Health Organization pretty much everywhere by 1971. Worldwide, hundreds of psychologists and psychiatrists abandoned promising psychedelic studies and successful therapeutic work in the face of the paranoid injunction, thou shalt not know. In 1968, shortly after I turned 20, I emigrated to Canada to get away from the rigidity of Swiss conventions. 
I uh, rented a room on Avenue Road in T Yorkville, Toronto's village, and within days I tried marijuana. I found it relaxing. It enhanced my musical experience. Next I smoked hash, the same, and I took my first LSD trip, a revelation of color and insight, and we'll get back to that. Yorkville Avenue in Toronto's village, also known as the Strip then, is a posh place nowadays in a gentrified neighborhood, but it used to be like Langstrasse in Zurich or Rheingasse here without the prostitution. In 1968, Toronto was experiencing the same summer of love that San Francisco had celebrated the year before. Yorkville was full of hippies in rags and feathers and full of looky-loos. Leering guys drove by very slowly in cars. Entire families were filming us. We were dropping acid left, right and center. Close your eyes, open your mouth, at birth control and there was no stopping us. Peace and love, baby. We didn't care whether LSD was legal and didn't question the dosage. The higher, the better. Casualties followed, although relatively few, considering how many naives took high doses of a hitherto, hitherto unknown substance. LSD came in drops, pills and blotters and it was then more widely available than mescaline, psilocybin, or MDA. While I liked to trip, it was also challenging. I struggled with LSD a few times, like Jacob with the angel. It was so important to me that I was past the acid, acid te test and be experienced, as they called it. I often tripped alone and sometimes ended up frightened and confused. Once I got stuck, I, I felt like my consciousness was hovering about three inches above my head and I, I couldn't get back in. But most of my trips were happy, though especially when in friendly and loving company. I wish LSD had been used therapeutically back in the day. I realized that there were many facets to my person, but I lacked the psychological tools to make sense of them. Knowing more about ourselves would have helped us. But my generation was more given to foolhardiness than to introspection. Most of us were unaware of the basic tenets of psychology, notions juggled by any 15-year-old nowadays, like Days like projection, motivation, repression, eluded us. And I it was already back in Switzerland and in my mid-twenties when I began to acquaint myself with Sigmund Freud and Carl Gustav Jung. The latter, a dignified older gentleman, had been pointed out to me in the late 50s when I first moved to Switzerland and lived in the street below his in Küsnacht. Eventually, we hippies intended to move to the country and live a simple and autonomous life. We were not greedy for money, nor keen on a career. With the end of the decade came the end of the idealistic innocence of the early hippie years, with some paranoia reigned supreme. In August of 1969, Members of Charles Manson's cult killed five people in Roman Polanski's Beverly Hills home, including his pregnant wife, the actress Sharon Tate. On December 6, 1969, a free concert was held at the Altamont Freeway in, Freeway in Livermore, near Berkeley, where, incidentally, or maybe not so incidentally, much of America's weaponry is developed, Livermore Laboratories. Given the, given the pre-sentient title, Let It Bleed Angels and Death Concert, what a shitty title, it was supposed to be the Woodstock of the West. 300,000 people responded to the lure of the Rolling Stones. The facilities were not equipped to deal with such masses, just getting there was rough. Temple tempers were flying off the handle, 
violence hang in, in the air like a, a sudden menace, aggravated by the presence of the Hells Angels who had been hired as security. Now this was not unusual. I was at the Rock and Roll Revival in Toronto, and they had two motorcycle bands. They were normally rivals, but for this they were not. Uh, they were called Satan's Choice, and the others the Vagabonds. And they occupied, they were responsible for security there, but other than, the, not unlike the Hells Angels, they occupied like a section over there in the Varsity Stadium at Toronto, in Toronto, and they just kept to themselves more or less, whereas the Hells Angels crowded the stage and, and provoked a tragedy. Despite interference by both Mick Jagger and Keith Richard, who pleaded with their audience and their guards, the Hells Angels trampled to death an 18-year-old black man. His name was Meredith Hunter. And these white guys threw themselves on this poor kid. He was only, he was very young, in what can only be called a racially motivated attack. That's what they did, and this is how it ended there. These sad events broke it to us that all was not love, peace, and happiness with my generation. <coughs> to sum things up, I'd like to say a few things about the benefits of high doses of LSD and about my personal position when it comes to psychedelic psychedelics. I advocate the right of any individual, adult individual, to the glorious adventure of body, mind, and soul that are psychedelics. Medically used substances that have been modified to exclude the high or the trip cannot and should not be called psychedelics. Because there is no revealing or manifesting going on. No awe, no catharsis, no profound healing. Only a different pill with an other effect. I'm not saying that the developments in psychedelics pharmaceuticals are all bad. And I'd be a fool not to acknowledge that a slew of highly useful new medication, medicines, may come from this. They may be called psychoactive, but not psychedelic. Substances like the classic psychedelics mescaline, psilocybin, ayahuasca, MDA, M uh, DMT, and LSD hold the promise of transformation, spiritual breakthrough, and uh, liberation. And they should be available to any willing adult supported by the, uh, by the guiding, guidance of experienced elders or friends, professional trip sitters, or medical professionals. Indigenous use of age-old sacraments must be left untouched instead of colonialized. And it's also perfectly fine to take a low dose of your favorite substance, and it's therapeutic to go to any tribal gathering and dance your heart out, if that's what you like and your body craves. In fact, I believe that a safe and legal solution must be found for all substances, psychedelic or not. If we manage in Switzerland to regulate heroin for the worst cases, sure we can, surely we can do well with all the other substances as well, as long as the political will is there. Coming back to LSD, essentially and from a therapeutic point of view, High doses make it more difficult to avoid a confrontation with yourself. They also may generate greater fear. Start slow, start low, go slow is the universal psychedelic mantra these days. Don't be foolish. Find out as much as possible about the substance you're going to take, what effect it has. Think of Tim Leary and his set and setting to reflect on the premises of the social environment you come from is also a very good idea. You know, the, the, how do your, does your family, how do your friends think about psychedelics? If they have a very negative attitude, it's maybe better not to talk 
about to about them to it because it will not make you feel better. This is a concept that was recently introduced by Maria Mangini of the uh, California Institute for Integral Studies and it's become a new psychedelic premise, one that was hiding in plain sight, I'd say, because obviously talking to people who invalidate you and your experience is not going to get you anywhere. So that last, but surely not least, make sure you have adequate company. The highest dose of LSD I ever took was 1,400 micrograms, or thereabouts. I used my journey to get to know my new love, and I think I like to think that I was quite lucid. It was a super fast ride and very telepathic between the two of us. This was in the early 80s. LSD seemed to make me smarter, and rapidly so. I was only 20 and still had a lot to, t to learn at the time, but we know now that psychedelics increase structural neuroplasticity in the brain leading to clearer thinking and more choices. And in fact, psychedelics, they're saying now, my, may directly interfere with our thinking processes. What LSD generally showed me is that I am not alone. Everything is connected and we are all one. Here, quantum physics and Eastern mysticism converge. We all live in the same universe. Nothing is ever lost, only transmuted. I was also told by a male voice in my head I've only once heard since, you need to go to the borders of reality to know where your limits are. <laughs> More concretely, to say it in the words of the author Robert Anton Wilson, I learned that 98% of everything is bullshit. Of no consequence are the competition for success, keeping up with the Joneses or the Millers and Myers, what religion you follow, your race, your looks, your clothes, your degrees, your grievances, or your ideas how, about how the world should be. You know, the kind of hissy-fitting outrage and equally meaningless commiseration we see so often nowadays. To paraphrase Gandhi, if you want change, be a part of the change you're looking for. And what does matter? Here I'm talking to you. After all these years, I'd still say that what matters most is love. To love and to live your life with passion. To love yourself, to love your family and your friends, to be kind and to embrace life in all its facets. And what if love is not enough? Of course it's not enough. Love is a great place to start, but a very sentimental place to finish. Start by being more loving and the rest will follow. Albert Hoffman says, the answers to our questions are to be found in nature, our nature. Thank you very much. Any questions? No questions, wow. Oh, here. Yes, you put uh, a sentence, uh, it's on the program. Something like, uh, the love may... You love to, that's what I said in the, it's a line from the Beatles. Uh, uh, that's what I said in the beginning. Okay. It's at the end, the very last okay. line of Abbey Road. Okay. They okay. sing it together. And they say that it was written by Paul McCartney. And I think it's a very good mo motto because in the 60s there was talk of love, 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 love all the time. Yes. And then I turn you with a question. <laughs> uh, you, you talked about, you finished with uh, the idea of our own nature. Mm -hmm. and for sure, love is a great part of it, and like in certain traditions, uh, we also put justice or wisdom as equal, equal importance. 
uh, equal with uh, uh, um, my my question is how do you think something uh, uh, of this need to to spread love we talked about before? How do you feel that uh, love can be transferred from an individual? Perspective, collective perspective, but well, the, simple <laughs> the simple answer is one by one, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I wrote this because when I held the same talk in Zurich at the Cabaret Voltaire, one guy protested and he said, Well, love is not enough, and we're gonna have to do this and that, a day, and us. And I said, Well, for me, there is no day enough. They are us and we are them, you know? And so the idea is that if you work on yourself and resolve some of the contradictions within yourself, you may find yourself in a place of more contentment and this contentment will lead to you feeling more loving in the world. And if you do that and you manage to be kind also to people who you totally disagree with and even may think a bit despicable, then I think that's a good step towards making for a more inclusive society. But if you look at the United States and what's happening there right now and how polarized things are, here you have the Republicans, there you have the Democrats, and they talk about each other as if they were the devil and poisoning each other's drinking water. And, and God knows, and, and this idea that there's they and then there's us, I think it just doesn't hold and that we in Europe, thank God, don't have this as strongly. Of course, also because we have a multi-party political party, party system and here in Switzerland, where we can't really avoid people who don't think like us. You know, we always, and I don't want to stop. It's like during the pandemic, I didn't lose one friend. One woman dropped me because I said it was unfair to say, that Bill Gates had predicted the pandemic. No, not Bill Gates, Fauci, four years before. I said, but that's his job, you know? It's like blaming the weatherman for telling him, telling him what the weather is going to be bad tomorrow. So she never talked to me again. But, you know, I don't mind. So, and, but that's the only friend I lost. Everybody else who didn't think like me, I, I don't mind. It's fine. It's just fine. And also, it turned out that, as usual, there's always also a little bottom of truth in all the conspiracies. It's not like it's all wrong and we are totally right. So again, we have this we and they that we must absolutely get rid of. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Yes, yes, please. So I created, I always liked the idea in the French novels, you know, you had the 17th, 18th century, there were these women, they had a salon, usually financed by their lovers or something, or somebody in high places, and people met there, men and women, and they would talk about the subject of the day, I guess, I don't know, but I guess the idea of the sort of better restaurant didn't exist yet. So that was where they met. And when people asked me, a couple of people asked me a few years ago whether I would um, maybe do something like, like create a group where people could meet, I immediately thought of this salon idea. And I started the psychedelic salon in my living room. And at the first, and I used my mailing list, whatever I had. And the first time, 12 people came. And the second time, more people came. And in the end, we were 26, 28 people, and it got a bit crampy. And I'd already been dreaming about you know, going and doing it at the Cabaret Voltaire as my favorite location, because in the <coughs> early 2000s, you know, it was a house that was falling apart, and it was squatted by artist friends of mine. I was also a part of that. I went there often, so I really knew the place. Plus, it's smack dab in the middle of the old part of town. It's really central. So uh, the woman who had uh, instigated all of this 
she knew a journalist and she called her up and she came and interviewed me. It's a big thing in the paper. Mrs. Seiler invites to the psychedelic salon. And the woman who runs uh, the Cabaret Voltaire was a bit worried, you know. She thought, oh my God, the police is going to come, who knows? Well, nothing happened except that we were totally overrun the first time <laughs> and we couldn't take everybody who wanted to come. It's a rather small place. We fit about 70, 80 people there. And, you know, it's the only place that I know that manages to be intimate and worldly at the same time. We Zoom our meetings there, we don't Zoom in Basel, we don't have as many people in Basel yet because we never advertised, we never went to the press or anything. So in Basel we've decided to keep it a little bit more intimate until we're a bigger group. But in Zurich we Zoom, zoom it and we have people all over the world watching now, which is a lot of fun, you know. So that's how this happened. And please come, welcome. Anybody who wants to, give me your email address or come and get a calling card, send me a little note and I'll put you on the mailing list. I mail out invites and I mail out summaries of each salon so that those who couldn't make it also have an idea of what happened there. And I tend to use Basel a bit as an experimental thing now that my living room can't be that anymore. And then the people then people next come to the Cabaret Voltaire and have a larger audience. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so, coming back to the topic of the talk, uh, you said that the love you take is the love you make, and there is this equality of ease, meaning that they somehow happen synchronously. But uh, I wanted to ask you, because in reality, maybe it's not how it happens. The parents first give us love and take it, and then we kind of make it. Uh, what do you think about this synchronicity, how to find it now? Because, you know, we have different histories. Well, it reminds me of the idea of paying forward. You don't pay back, you pay forward. You give, and then somebody else will give to you. Maybe now, maybe later, maybe not. But you pay forward, you don't pay back. The idea of the love you take is equal to the love you make is just the idea that a little bit, like people maybe, there's a kind of a worry in there, you know? What if I give and give and give and nothing ever comes back? But that's not really the way it works. It's not what life has shown me. I, all kinds of people, strangers often, you know about the kindness of strangers, people do all kinds of things for you when you expect it least. So. Be confident that if you take this kind of an attitude, it will come back to you, for sure. And you don't have to count. In French they say, quand on aime, on compte pas. <laughs> when you love, you don't count. Yes? I took four window panes, and each of them was more than two, two, three, three hundred or something. I don't. I, I tell you guys one thing. I heard Matthias Liechtig speak last fall, and he said, "Well, you, the acid loses its strength pretty soon." And these people thought they were taking high doses, but actually were not taking high doses. Well, he wasn't there is one thing. And on the other hand, there is, of course, again, some truth in this, because you don't know exactly what you're getting. You don't know how fast it, it, it loses its strength. So I think what I took must have been between 1,200 and 1,400, according to what it was supposed to be. It certainly was the craziest LSD trip I ever had. I, I saw my new boyfriend, I saw his character, I, I had a different categories for him. One was this guy I called the Japanese tea house philosopher. He was this guy who knew everything and he was pissing down wisdom on everybody. <laughs> that was the one part. Then there was a second guy who was like a, 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 a sailor. 
he was in jeans and, you know, cut off jacket and had a lot of muscle. And we were at this fun fair and he said, I'll buy you anything you like. <laughs> so that was fun. And the third, of course, was the prince in the garden of earthly delight and the lover. And, well, it was all very beautiful. <laughs> and we saw many things, we talked about it later, that we both saw. And that's what happens with higher doses of any of it. It just becomes, you become, all of a sudden it becomes telepathic, people have shared visions, all kinds of stuff. Weirdness starts happening, let's say. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>